Welcome to the B3 In-Depth episode number two. My name is Johannes Grenzfurtner. I'm an artist and activist, filmmaker. I founded an art and theory collective called Monochrome some 30 odd years ago. And it is a great pleasure for me being able to host this series of conversations with great creative minds all around the globe. Uh, number two, will deal with Sandra Mann. And I'm very, very happy that uh, we could get her in front of her notebook and webcam for an hour long conversation about her work. So uh, who is Sandra Mann? Uh, she is a German artist and photographer. She does a lot of cross genre work. So really interesting stuff. We'll be talking about it. Uh, she deals conceptually with the relationship between uh, people, uh, with nature, uh, with the environment, uh, the animal world, uh, also, of course, gender issues. And uh, there's a quote on Wikipedia. I'd like to read that to you. Her work is characterized by research into the fundamentals of photography and visual language. So pretty much exactly what the B3 Biennial is dealing with. So I would like to start with uh, a little trailer, a little video about Sandra's work. Uh, Baram, uh, please uh, mats up. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, well, let, let, let's you. dive right into the subject. So, like, because I talked about it before, the, the, the research into the fundamentals of photography and visual language. So, would you, would you like to pick one of your projects that kind of exemplifies that research drive that you seem to have? Um, yes, uh, maybe. We can talk about the one with the um, with the cups. It was picture number, I think, nine. Number nine. Okay, Baram maybe, has, maybe probably has Baram it somewhere can, in the back. Can show it. It's the one with the white cups and uh, and Jessica Schäfer. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's it. Well, this was one of the important photographs. And I took it with Jessica Schäfer. She also studied at uh, in HFG uh, in Hochschule für Gestaltung. And we just construct an idea that we show. I mean, you see, um, it's better to, to ask questions. What do you see? That's the first thing. Okay, good. Okay, Jonas. because I don't know the word. <laughs> let let me let me give an interpretation of what do I see. So, I see. Uh, a woman sitting in a pond and there are and on the first glance i thought it's flowers but is it mm -hmm. flowers no it's plastic cups is it yeah right and that okay. comes from our collective memory because we all all or most of us saw the monet picture how to say the the water lilies and because of that, we are so into this illusion that we, we don't see the plastic cups anymore. And that's, that was very interesting for me. It's made in 2014, mm -hmm. but it still has this um, trick or yeah, illusion. Absolutely. I mean, you got me. You got me because when I just when I saw the picture, my brain immediately interpreted as like lovely like a lovely lady and uh, in a lovely pond with lovely flower uh, petals like floating around but then no oh it's plastic cups oh my <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
and it's not just because there are plastic cups it's also the the special perspective because you can of course you can take photos in in different perspective and heights and i took a ladder so it's it's the same perspective like monet used and that's why it comes so much to this uh, double um, so like, you, uh, you you get influenced by this trick absolutely absolutely Let's jump back a little bit. So, because <laughs> okay. I mean, it's always, it's always. Uh, I mean, we're ready to jump back now to to that work to 2014. But let's jump way back. So, you were born <laughs> in 1970. I was born in 75. So, we were kind of like a similar generation. Yeah. The generation that grew up with only two television channels and stuff like that. So, it's uh, kind of like a weird time. But when did you actually decide? that you would be interested in pursuing a career doing art or photography? Because, I mean, were you a creative child from the very beginning or like how did that evolve? Yes, I started very early while I was um, constructing robots actually. Mm. And um, I was, um, my uncle, he had a, a shop in, in um, Merfeld Baldorf and he got a lot of uh, products um, from the, um, how do you say, ah, anyway, uh, and these products were, um, were um, covered in boxes mm -hmm. and out of these boxes I created robots and later I had a course at uh, half gay with um uh was it lewis balls i'm not so sure because he was just a guest lecturer mm -hmm. and um we did an exhibition at uh, airport gallery and there i show also these uh, robot uh, robots robots yeah robots, yeah, robots. <laughs> but you, you showed the robots you made when you were a kid or did you build new robots based on um, that idea i redesigned it and mm -hmm. i took boxes from different countries so they were very international because the airport was an inter international um space so i thought it's a very nice idea to have an uh, international robot group Ah, no, absolutely. it was with Heiner Blum, I guess. Sorry. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, like for all the people out there, I mean, the B3 is happening in Frankfurt. Like most people on the on, on the planet only know Frankfurt through the airport. So it also makes complete sense. So are yeah. there many uh, uh, projects that are art uh, art based that are kind of like in cooperation with the airport? Or is this something that happens only like once in a while? Um, the airport had um, a so-called airport gallery but mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it still exists. That was in the time of, oh, it was around 2000. So already 20 years ago. Mm. I, wow. I doubt that it still exists also because of the pandemic. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, issues. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so as a kid, you built uh, cardboard uh, boxes, robots, and like, how, how did that go on? Yeah. Um, one of the very early works, maybe Baran can show it, was from 1998. I was very interested in religion and I had a stipend in, from the University of Augsburg. And it took place in Irsee, that's in the so-called Allgäu. And there was a little church. It was a church on a cemetery. and. When you see in the background, you see the fire of hell. Oh yeah, so the, the, the skulls and all these like demons and creatures there, I can see it, yeah. Yeah, and it was very funny because of the skulls, because it's also a very old motif in the tattoo scene. And well, my tattoo on the back was one of the first works I did while I was drawing in also in half game. And I loved the idea to have a drawing which i can take everywhere i go that's why this kind of tribal tattoo um, happened and i okay, designed well, it okay well. let me ask you so you 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 designed a tattoo and then you had a tattoo artist put that on your skin yes oh wow but that was and very, like how did that work how was the cooperation with the tattoo artist uh, so, sorry again please how was the the cooperation with the tattoo artist so like did you did you make the drawing you designed it you gave it over to the tattoo artist 
Mm -hmm. And like, how did you kind of like, did you have to do a lot of micromanagement so it wouldn't get botched up? Because I mean, there is only one try, I guess. Yes. I mean, I was uh, drawing a lot of designs and finally I found one which was very nice. And I started with the left arm, then I felt a little bit um, uh, um, not in a harmonic way. So I um, took the other arm as, arm as well. And then I had the feeling I need a, commun a, a connection between the two arms. So that's how, how it happened that it developed to a big tattoo. And um, finally, I used also my body as a, as a part of sculpture or as a, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm totally yeah. fascinated by tattoos, but I would never ever get one. It's strange. I'm, I'm <laughs> completely obsessed with it, but yeah. on me, no, no. I'm maybe also I'm, I'm, I'm a wimp or something like that. I don't know. But we did a project a couple of years ago where we dealt a lot with, you know, like, uh, 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 international brands and logos and stuff like that. And one of our projects involved that a friend of us got an Ikea tattoo on his biceps. Mm -hmm. So we branded him with an Ikea tattoo as part of a bigger project. And so I had to deal a lot with, with tattoos back then. And it's, uh, it's, it's totally fascinating, but, but that's a good question. Uh, like speaking of, 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 about tattoos, because it seems, and there is, Still, I mean, we're we're in the year 2021, but there seems to be still a big divide between the so-called high arts and and pop culture, the high arts and low art, and tattoo and tattoo artists are usually not considered high arts. They are just like their own realm. There's they're they're like an art scene that is not in any way really connected to what we call the art scene. So yeah. how how do you see that? Are you like do you jump between different uh, art scenes a lot? I mean, the funny thing is I have a very big tattoo, of course, yeah. and um, but I'm really not interested in tattoos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it was in, in former times when I was working in clubs uh, um, to um, also to um, to finance my studies. The people or a lot of uh, people, they were tattooed, always wanted to talk about tattoos. And I'm mm -hmm. really not so much into the tattoo scene and I'm not so much interested in this um, in this uh, uh, um, theme. And um, for me, it's just really a drawing which I can take. And um, mm -hmm. but I know there are a lot of uh, really good tattoo artists and they see tattoo as of course their art and there are some i think some french guys they tattoo really strange things like you you wouldn't um like just lines and things and it's it's not not as much or it's it's not anymore like in former times when the tattoo was a, a sign of a special um part of the society of a, in which level you um yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not. I'm not only talking about tattoos, but in general, it seems that there are certain forms of art that are not really accepted. And I always had mm -hmm. the feeling that tattoo is something like this. Like, ah, oh, it's kind of an art, but it's not. It's almost like yeah. you know, like there, there are many people out there who do creative work, but would never call themselves artists. Like mm -hmm. someone who who has an interest, I don't know, like uh, in in drawing, you know, like. Uh, 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 like making pencil drawings of horses just as a hobby or something like that. And there seem to seem to be lots of fields where somehow really interesting work is being done, but it's never recognized by the actual art world. So yeah. my, my, my question was but more targeted. But what is the with... actual art world? Exactly. That's the question. Exactly. Yeah. And I think um, uh, maybe I'm a bit borderless, so I don't uh, think in those categories I had some very nice discussions with artists about what is art, what isn't art, and where's the border. But I think everyone has to ask himself if where is his border. And I, I'm always really interested in these borders. So what I always like to check out is where is the, where's this, um, this uh, how do you say? Mm, Where's the place where it's 
something. Yeah, I don't like these categories. I would say yeah. you have to try out in, in how far you can go. And, and um... I mean, like from my perspective, that's where the really interesting work is happening. So, I mean, yeah, in the last 10 years, it. most of the really interesting, you know, like media art for my taste came out of hackerspaces and hackerspaces mm -hmm. and people in hackerspaces don't even call themselves artists. They're yeah. just like tinkerers. They just like do creative work. I mean, for yeah. my, my utopia actually is that the term of art at some point will stop to exist because we all just like do what we like to do and we don't need this like strange concept of the art market and this like scarcity models and uh, yeah. But may maybe you could give us an example of another project that you think try to challenge the, the boundaries, the borders mm -hmm. that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, I used to work a lot in the um, music scene and um, I did a lot of uh, record covers in former times and a lot of um, photographs of uh, musicians. So we can show maybe one, but it also had a research in it of society. So for example, this is a girl which I took in a club. And she is accompanied by her parrot. It's Cherry. I guess her name was Cherry. <laughs> and for me, it was so funny because, of course, that's pictorial language. The woman with, with her big hair grows into a tree. And, well, Cherry is sitting on this tree. <laughs> and, yeah, I like this, this mix between kind of nature and at the same time this kind of artificial nightlife club scene so that's how it started that i got interested in those pictures yeah yeah and that's that's a mix between both maybe we can show another one because mm -hmm. then it changed oh that's obviously uh, also, in an I, art I context work... that looks very arty <laughs> yeah that's very arty <laughs> that was in muka in mexico city but the first edition was bought in 2001 by the Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt by MMK. And it's an ordinary IKEA shelf, which is used by many DJs for uh, archiving their LP records. But the special thing of it is that in this shelf are just love records. Unfortunately, I don't have now a close up, but normally you see in every single record the word love, and it's about love in the aquarium, love is everywhere, or how it feels to be in love, and all these. As different, you mean because um, there are so many, so many LPs that have love in the yeah. title. Okay. Yes. And it's a mix between music styles of course there's jazz there's rock there's uh, electronic music uh, it's a mix of um, different countries like it's um, from from everywhere in the world where the the, the authors of these records and um, what else it's it was three things <laughs> it's uh, um, it's like uh, environment, then the the music itself, and the the of course the time. So you have a mix between these three uh, points, and that's the thing why I find I find it so interesting. And when you look at these these different records, you always have your own experiences uh, in mind when you, for example, was the first time in love or you were angry or you have um, you were um, sad or things like that so it's also a compilation of feelings mm -hmm. yeah i mean i guess that's that's also true for, for 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 any kind of art because how my personal what i'm feeling or like if i have a bad day and i go into a museum and see an exhibition the exhibition will kind of be, t be tainted by that, by my bad feelings. And maybe the exhibition is good enough that it brings me out of that mood. I don't know. But I mean, it's hard to distinguish between who you are and what the art is that you're looking at or the art that you're 
consuming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I really love the work which you did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. It, it's the one um, you did on a demonstration. It's so funny. I don't know. Maybe you can explain it a bit better. I think it was in the in the east part of Germany where they showed a very special sign. You know what I mean? Which one was that? Huh? My God, I did so many things in Germany, special sign. Yeah, yeah, you showed the Hitler Gruß and and I really like that they Oh, were, oh yeah, they yeah, yeah that, that wasn't me. Oh, you mean the you mean the Nazi padding zoo? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Now that was in Vienna. That was in Vienna. Because ah, we, I, I, I Vienna. did a couple I of projects. I did a couple of projects that dealt with like Nazism. Of course, I'm an Austrian and Austrians never really dealt with the Nazi past. I think the Germans did a better way dealing with it. We'll see how that goes and if that was uh, like made a big difference. But I mean, the, the story is it's called Nazi uh, uh, Nazi padding suit or Streichel Nazi, and we wanted to deal with the pretty much like the, the not dealing with Austrian history as Austrians. So mm -hmm. we wanted to be able to to so we wanted to have a Nazi on the street in a little padding zoo with hay in it, and the Nazi would sit there, and you could go there and hug the Nazi and feed the Nazi and embrace the Nazi, in a certain mm -hmm. way, like embrace the Nazi in all of us and in Austrian history. And we were planning to 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 not doing that longer than 10 or 15 minutes because our expectation was that the police would immediately show up because you can't just like put a guy with a swastika on the street it's you know like mm -hmm. it's it's forbidden you can't do that but we were sitting there for seven or eight hours and doing it uh because the police walked by and said like ah oh, whatever we don't want to deal with this so the police just like let us be which kind of changed the whole performance because first we thought it would be like a 10 minute thing and then we would go to the police office and the rest of the performance would be at the police office but no we were sitting there seven hours on the street and people came by and hugged the nazi and fed the nazi and uh, it was a big it was a big deal lots of newspapers wrote about it so it was uh, yeah there is a there's a youtube video if you google for nazi petting yeah. zoo you'll find it yeah for all yeah the i like those so social it. interventions it's yeah. it's really um it's Upwaking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the main problem with art is that it's 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 hiding. You know, it's most of the time hiding in galleries, and there are some yeah. people who just don't go to a gallery. My mother would never go to a gallery, and, and the best quote was like, "I'm not going to a gallery. I don't know what to wear." So, <laughs> what does yeah. it matter? Just like go there and like, nah. There there is this like strange talking about boundaries and borders there is this like strange border of like going into an art space mm -hmm. and i hate that <laughs> yeah well at the same time it's of course uh, necessary for artists to sell their work and that's the place so um i um i think but it will change in the future now we have a big a marketplace like the internet and um, a lot of artists are dealing with it. So I think it changed. Mm -hmm. As a photographer, how is your uh, general stance on the whole debate about that started like, uh, like 10, 15 years ago about copyright and the internet? Because I mean, especially for someone like you who does photography a lot, uh, I mean, a photograph is the easiest to copy and reproduce and not getting your credit and all that stuff. Uh, at the same time, it seems like the very moment mankind entered the era of the internet, some basic conceptions of copyright just like died because there is no way that it can be like it was. So what, what is your perspective on that? Um, I think it's still um i mean the the copyright rules we had um already a long time ago so that didn't change it it's just a bit um the pictures are more spread but on the other hand they were spread before as well in postcards and flyers and things like that so mm, i think that changed not too much it's a more um, 
and and also if you sell a work and you sign it then it's it yeah, has you put its your stamp identity on it, yes. and you have an edition of course you you should have editions as a photographer but on the other hand i mean people like barbara Clem, for example she doesn't have an edition she just make as many pictures as she make in her uh, lifetime and then there are no pictures anymore from her so she has no edition and still she has a good price because her work is very well i think it's up to the quality of your work so if you make um i think pictures they don't um they have no expression then nobody wants to uh, to uh, uh nobody wants to sell them uh, to mm -hmm. to to uh, buy them there uh, i saw this great interview with david bowie a couple of days ago on youtube and he said that it's so bizarre that out of this like enormously creative graffiti scene in new york in the late 70s and early 80s uh only three artists uh Basquiat and 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 Keith mm -hmm. Haring and I can't even remember the third one he he mentioned, but but only like three people kind of like made it into the gallery scene or the uh, the high art scene, and of course uh, like he kind of attacks that and says that's just like that's the gatekeeping mechanism because the guard that uh, the, the gallery scene is not interested in having like two hundred graffiti artists because it would destroy the market, so yeah. they kind of like breed like a number yeah. of artists and then they they make them big so uh to a certain degree i see that that's how a market works on the other hand i completely hate it as a creative person yes of because course. to a certain degree <laughs> i know i might be one of the people who is not being led in by the gatekeepers so what is your uh how did you deal with that kind of stuff with galleries the gatekeepers uh, trying to get into the press because it's so weird it's such a weird uh mechanism that's going on ah. <laughs> i think the the first thing the first important thing is to make very good work and i don't make the work for the market i work them i make the work for my um research for my um curiosity <laughs> and um when you make good work, then it sells itself. And of course, if you have a good gallerist, then it um, pushes you. But on the other hand, every artist I know, also the big artists, they sell a lot over galleries. They are um, finally, you are a one person company and you have to find a way how you um, finance your life. And well, galleries is just one part of it, maybe. So I deal with them when I make an uh, exhibition, but actually I don't have so many exhibitions in galleries. I have more exhibitions in off spaces, in, in museums. And for me, it's more important to show the work to a brighter audience and not to sell, but it depends on the artist. Some artists have the focus more on selling over galleries and then they have more, of course, more exhibitions in, in galleries and some are friends of galleries. So um, it's also a, um, a possibility to deal with the art market. It's, I think it's very diverse. It, it depends on the artist and well, for me, it's always important to make a good work and to reach for a brighter public. Mm -hmm. More important than to sell um, artworks. You, you're doing uh, art projects yourself, so you're an artist. So you're not mm -hmm. only documenting other people's art, but that's mm -hmm. also what you're doing. So you're on, the, on the one hand, you are, you're an artist making your own art, but then you're yes. also a photographer documenting art. Uh, could you tell us a little uh, bit no, about the difference? No, I don't document art, actually. Mm -hmm. No, oh, you don't I, document um, art. Okay. No, no, I I make portraits and and ah. uh, and um, well, 
very rare I, I documented art of friends, for example. But most of the time I document uh, yeah, my own exhibitions <laughs> mm -hmm. and also the exhibitions I curate. That's maybe that's maybe what you've seen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In internet. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I. Well, what's interesting for me is because it's I kind of like a completely different job or different different vocation to to create your own uh, independent artwork. But also, mm -hmm. I mean, portrait photography is a very very precisely defined service. Let's call it. But, yes. but you have to really, but you really have to excel being good at it. And and I, I really like 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 your portraits. They are they are great. So how is it different working on your own projects and kind of like serving another person's idea of a portrait? Uh, normally they call me to have a portrait, um, and um, actually it's not so much to. A service it's more that they want the, the portrait like an artwork so ah, okay. it's not so much um that it's like a service okay yeah. so they're, they're 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 hiring you because they say like sandra will have a great creative idea how to to present myself yes okay yeah. and can, can you tell tell us a, a, a couple of anecdotes about how that process works or uh how 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 that that like uh Something that was very challenging in that in that realm. Of, of, um, of well, yes, I can show you. For example, maybe we can show um, picture number three. Yeah, oh. yeah. This is called Sandra with beard, but it's not me. It's it's another Sandra, and that, for example, was made in two thousand. Uh, 2000 yes and it was a very nice evening and some girls in frankfurt they found this uh, magazine it was a gay magazine and then they um, pulled out that beard and put it in front of their faces and they were about 10 or 12 um, girls at that time but finally there was just one picture i liked so much because it fits so well together with the face that it gets an own new um, portrait. That, for example, is one of them. And then the second thing I found out was that uh, women weren't allowed to smoke a long time. So the thing to have a beard and to smoke, it's like a double meaning of gender issue. So that's why I think that the Stern magazine, they called it one of the best contemporary artworks or photographs. And I think that was the reason for it. Yeah, this is, for example, a portrait I took. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> and uh, I heard that uh, it got bought by the, the Börse by the, mm -hmm. in Frankfurt, so by, yeah. the, by the stock market. Yeah, so yeah. it's hanging somewhere like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really funny. <laughs> it's it's I mean, strange because it's, 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 a, it's like you, you never know where the stuff ends up, you know? Sorry? You never know where your art ends up, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I had the exhibition at uh, Museum of Modern Art at MMK in Frankfurt and the former director was uh, Jean-Christophe Amann and he was also the, the um, how do you say, uh, not coach, um, ah, I mean, he was um, he was a friend also of Anna Marie Beckmann, who was the, the who was leading the the art collection, and so he I think uh, um, suggested proposed me to um, that they buy my work, and um, finally that's how it happened. But I I I didn't imagine that it um, it would take place in a in a part of like <laughs> art collection Deutsche Börse, the stock market. Yeah, it, it's strange. <laughs> like I, I remember one of our, uh, we, we, like at Monochrome, we, we hardly do any flatware as we call it, Flachware. We hardly do mm -hmm. any 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 really printed or painted stuff, but we did a 
project of a couple of paintings a couple of years ago and i think the city of vienna bought some of them and then they ended up hanging in the office of the ambassador of austria in indonesia or something like that and i thought like oh my god <laughs> where is this stuff going i have no yeah. control over where it's hanging yeah that's nice <laughs> yeah that's nice nice but uh, we have been talking a lot about photography uh and the B3 biennial is uh, the biennial of the moving image and also new approaches at like VR and all that stuff. You have been uh, doing filmmaking as well, am I right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little use, bit about that? Yeah, for me, it's it's like I'm, I don't make many um, um, uh, changes between um, photography and moving images. So there, for me, there is no difference. It's just moving. It's a picture, but it's moving. So that is my link to moving images. Yeah. So I also did um, little movies, I would say. Mm -hmm. Short films or like more like Short experimental films. stuff or? Um, yes. It's, I mean, one, it's called Bala Bala. It's, um, I did with, uh, um, it was about religion. Actually, it has a link to my very first work in the church. Also this work, it deals with religion because I was always asking myself, oh, am I religion? Do I uh, believe in Jesus? And, oh, this is Manana, by the way. Oh, hey, good to meet <laughs> <Sorry>. you. <Hey. laughs> and, um, yeah, the link to religion. I yes, I um, I asked the uh, German soccer team, um, a women's soccer team, to play in front of the old market hall of Frankfurt, which is now ECB, uh, European Central Bank, and I placed them in front of it because it's a very historic place. They have an issue with uh, transporting Jews to the KZ. Also, they have a link to religion. And and the, ah, the, the women soccer team, the German women soccer team, they were wearing a black shador. So they look like a Muslim soccer team. Mm -hmm. And I just read uh, sh uh, shortly before that the Iranian um, women are not allowed to play soccer because they uh, the there could be men seeing something, but ah, okay. at the ah, same yeah. and and they didn't play. But finally, I still stayed on all the rules, so you didn't see hair coming out of their shadow, or you didn't see details of their like. Yeah, but uh, I, I, really, I can I can imagine it's, it's like I, I you. Could, you you you, try, you 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 kind of try to prove the concept that it would work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, finally, it was a very funny um, little uh, short movie and also a music video because the music was from um, Sven Feit and he did one piece that is really the, that's why it calls Bala Bala. It's really crazy. I think he must be very drunk when he um, produced it. Yeah. I mean, for, for all the so you know Sven Veit, he made it for for your yeah, piece. Yeah. So yeah, okay, great. Yeah, because for yeah. all the people, I mean, if if you kind of grew up being interested in techno music, you know who Sven Veit is. For all the others yeah. out there who don't know, just Google it. You know, <laughs> you'll you'll find yeah, yeah. out. He's he, a did, electronic he, did, he did some music, crazy projects. Uh, guru, I would say. Yeah. 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 But in, in general, that's, that's, for example, that's also for me an interesting relationship I have to, to Hessia and Frankfurt is that a lot of, you know, like great underground techno came out of Frankfurt in the 1990s. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. so that's just like, and uh, so what, what is Frankfurt known for for me? Like I know it for, for the stock exchange, I know it for the airport, and I know it for techno, underground techno. It's so strange, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> three very important things <laughs> yeah and not even talking about grüne sauce but nobody knows yeah. that besides people in hesse i did in um i think it was in 2000 a very nice exhibition at muson turm frankfurt mm -hmm. with uh, 31 um musicians electronic musicians there's manana again <laughs> and um i um put 
31 DJs together and show at the same time their their music. In uh, it's it's really too complicated to to um, to explain, but you can see a picture on my homepage. So um, it looks like very colorful tubes, and in every tube where the music coming where you can hear. And mm -hmm. when you enter the room, it's like a big music chaos. But uh, at the same time, you can hear over every tube the actual uh, recordings. Oh, so there was a big cacophony, of course, musicians. because the music mm -hmm. was playing at the same time. But if you yeah, would take like one of the... It's like a big landscape, yeah. Ah, nice. How many, how many electronic musicians were you working with uh, for that piece? Uh, 31. 31. And it was in the genre of uh, electronic music, like uh, Anthony Rota, for example, maybe you know them. He, mm -hmm. he was, he had a very nice album called Biomechanic. And actually, I took also photos of him also for the cover of this album. And it's very inspired by, um, um, I don't know now, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice electronic album and we can put uh, all of that later on if you if you yeah. remember we put it into the comments and people can find it there yes so that's, that's a the good, good thing about the internet yeah wow the internet doesn't forget so yay yay <laughs> well so uh just recently uh you have been awarded uh the goethe plakette by by the city of frankfurt together yes. Which is which I find so bizarre with Hans fucking Zimmer, <laughs> <laughs> you and Hans Zimmer, <clears throat> which for me is I wouldn't even say it's opposite, but Hans Zimmer for me represents a very very creative but also a very mainstream approach to art. I mean, mm -hmm. the first things he made, you know, were like uh, with the 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 Ruddles was you know. Uh, video killed the radio star and that kind of stuff. And then he, he he stopped doing pop music, but ended up in super commercial, high level Hollywood music. Uh, and and then there's you, who still has a very clear root in underground culture and club culture and music and all of that stuff. And both of you got uh, the Goethe plakette. Uh, so first of all, for all the people out there, could you, for the people who don't know what the Goethe plakette is, try to explain what that is? Oh wow! Yes, I mean it's a it's a plug. <laughs> yeah. You get it for your special work, your creative work, and there are some other um, artists, and not just artists. Also, Albert Schweitzer got it. Uh, Adorno. Uh, who else? Unfortunately, very less uh, women. That was, for me, the funniest thing was that I was the 18th woman of 165. Imagine that <laughs> amount. And I, um, when I did a little research and then I found there were times when five people got it at the same year. But when there were five people, then two women and three men. So it was always like to, they, they had to, um, to kind of balance it out or something to balance or... it out. If they took too many women, <laughs> it's really funny. And but, um, I mean, it's crazy. But... You have an award that also Alba Schweitzer got. Yes. That's crazy. <laughs> but also Sven Feit and Moses Pelham. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And Hans Zimmer is from Frankfurt. Yeah, that's, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the no, that, that's why I'm asking because I, I read I read the Wikipedia article about the Goethe plaque, Goethe plaque, mm -hmm. because I heard of it but I didn't really know what that is and I thought like if 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 you got it I really want to dive into the details, and there is like on the English Wikipedia there's nothing about it. It just says mm -hmm. like yeah it's the Goethe plaque and the city of Frankfurt gives it out. And here's the list of people who got it, but no explanation whatsoever what that really is. So it seems so uh, people they think who do interesting work who were at some point or are based in Frankfurt, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a special prize from Frankfurt. You get it from the city of Frankfurt, from the Magistrat, and there's a jury and they decide who they um, award to, uh, for this prize. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's, it was the, a the big good, surprise yeah. for me as well. <laughs> yeah. The good thing is uh, that uh, we definitely, in this episode, because in the first episode we had with Cello Biafra, we didn't have any Hess-Bezug, you know? Like ah, no, okay. no, no, no relation to Hessia, besides yeah. that, you know, like... Uh, Jello has been there many, many times for his concerts and stuff like that. But of course, the B three, uh, we get funding also from this, uh, from from Hesse and stuff. So the, in your in your case, the Hessian truth is very clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you actually <clears throat> been uh, uh, been based out of uh, Frankfurt for for parts of your life, or have you been? Uh, truthful to, to, to Hesse in, in, in your creative work and, and lived there most of the time? Uh, I lived in Frankfurt most of the time, but I was for three months, I was in Helsinki, for example, I had a stipend there, then I was a lot of times in, in um, Los Angeles, also in, in USA and in Mexico, I was a long time, six weeks. And um, yeah, so I traveled a lot while my studies and now, finally, I have um, three dogs. <laughs> mm -hmm. That makes traveling a little bit hard. Seen. Yeah, so I'm a bit more um, stable in Frankfurt, but yeah. I'm still, um, I mean, right now, just through the pandemic, I cannot travel, of course, yeah. or I travel less and um, just if really necessary, but yeah. Wonderful. So, I mean, I we already trouble. talked like more than 30 minutes already. So uh, I would like to, to, to go a little bit back to some of the projects that you prepared. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can pick out like two or three more uh, of the projects that are very dear to your heart and, and, and talk about them. That would be really nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe it's good to show um, the next one. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Oh, Chanel. Nice. Yeah. That's Where is that? That's also an important piece. It looks just like a place with trash, but of course it's more. It's a very, actually a very important picture for our times now because the, the level of poor and rich people are so um, diverse. And I think we really have to do something against it. And that's a big challenge. And to make it more visible, that's, I think it's uh, the challenge for photographers, like you see here in this picture. Where did you take it? I mean, it was uh, um, in, in my beginning of photo taking photographs, I photographed everything. I have more than 600,000 dye slides. And it was for me like writing a diary. So that's why in every picture, I also, I sell them, but in every picture is always the, um, the date and the number of the um, photograph. Mm -hmm. So that's why they always have a long number in front and then the title. And um, I don't know the name in, in English, Wohlstandsmüll, how can you translate this? Well, uh, that, that's a good that's a good German word Wohlstandsmüll it's yeah like, like, I, uh, I love German words especially oh, yeah. when they are very old yeah. and when, also when... I like the, 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 the German language because it's so detailed you can very much um, yeah. describe things with a little touch of something absolutely yeah you just like take two words you put mm -hmm. them together and you created a new concept that's why I, I think, think it's, it's just like yeah. so bizarre. It doesn't work in English in, in hardly any other language uh, that you can just like create. You can take two random words and, yeah. and create a new philosophical concept pretty much. And if you translate it, Wohlstand means actually richness, but it's not the right word for Wohlstandsmüll. It's um, yeah. richness. Yeah, Müll is trash, garbage or trash. Not... And Wohlstand is... Uh, I think it, the connotation is almost like it's trash that results out of an overabundance, an abundance of things. You have too much, and that's why you that's why you throw away a lot or something. There is, uh, it, it doesn't really, it always it carries along a meaning that's not really in the words. You know, like Weltschmerz. You know, like yeah. that's, or, or, or Poltergeist. Uh, I mean, yeah. all these like terms that 
made it to the English language uh, because there is no uh, equivalent ah. there. But uh, yeah, we yeah. can just like make it. <laughs> or doppelganger. Do you, did you know that doppelganger exists in? I was I read it. Uh, I don't know exactly 17 or 19 different languages. The word doppelganger because it, it doesn't so German. Nice. Yeah. Ah. And because we did a show in in um, LA at the uh, um, Torrance Art Museum, my friend um, 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 and me, and maybe we can show this uh, photo. It's a bit later. It's number zero two zero four one six. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. What do we see and here? And Julia Constanze Dissel, my friend, she and me, we were curating the show. And we had the concept to show 15 artists from Frankfurt, Germany, and ask the curators from Torrance Art Museum to find 15 doppelgangers from the US, from Los Angeles. And that was one of the photos. And I also um, took a part. So I had a double function of, um, this is also a funny thing. It's not so much, um, the, the art scene don't like it so much when um, artists are also curators, but in the US they are a little bit more, not so straight with it. And I think there still exists a book artist as curators. I don't know, but that was a really nice project. And uh, on the wall behind, uh, on, in the background, you see some works from John, Kos uh, John Knut mm -hmm. and Florian Heinke and... Who did the Jesus? Yeah, he is so cool. One second, one second, I tell you. <laughs> because, I mean, it's just a very small picture. Ah, I know. And... <laughs> I'm back. It was Eric Janka. He's okay. really great and he's also a very, very good painter and he's working in a very uh, political way. Is it a painting I or a, a photography? Sorry? Is it a painting or a photograph? It's a drawing, actually. It's a drawing? I think it's Oh my God, cold. it's very, it's, 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 it jumps right at you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so the left one from Florian Heinke, was uh, the right one was the doppelganger of him so we always compared or we proposed works and mm -hmm. the american creators they supposed other artists who are the doppelganger of the frankfurt artists so it was a really nice concept oh and so show. They, okay I, I, okay n now i get it so the whole the whole exhibition was about doppelgangers yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. I thought it, it was gee, about I, God, I, I completely but, uh, mis misread the whole thing. I thought that only your piece is about the doppelgangers. But no, no, no. Okay, no. great. Uh huh. Yeah, and it's it's not so easy because it's a very complex work to find a doppelganger. It's it's not just the work. It's not just the artist, and also the whole life or the whole art life of this or is it the concept which is the doppelganger so it's um it was really interesting to see how the american creators deal with this issue of doppelganger so th so they were trying to find if i if i if i i hope i'm correct so they were trying to find artists in the us that they could so to speak pair up with artists from europe that were somehow similar in some reason, yes. like in, in, in the way yeah. they were presenting their art, in the way, like like <clears throat> something was was uh, yeah. reminded them of yeah. another artist's work. Okay. And cool. of course, it was also because I I came to the idea because I recognized that um, uh, artists in different countries have the same idea at the same moment sometimes. So it's like a wave which. Um, which 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 is coming through countries and a friend of mine it started in 2006 a friend of mine Ichiro Iri which he he is a very good curator from LA and he was living long time in Mexico City working with Teresa Magoyes and and creating also many shows and he had the idea for example to um, show the air pollution 
the mm. bad air pollution and he made uh, photographs of the um, sundown of um, from LA and the, the sundowns are very very nice because um, of the bad pollution of the air oh and because the, the particles in the air make yeah, the, the, of the this waves of light break differently right. and I took I did a work with white t-shirts and I asked some artists to put the name of this their city on it like for example um, Mexico City or Tokyo and uh, put them with like stickers on it and uh, wear, wear these t-shirts white new t-shirts for one week and send it to me and then I pulled off the stickers and you could read the name of the city it had to be cities over 8000 million inhabitants and then the bad pollution is also um, visible it's like a drawing of uh, a t-shirt uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So and you were, yeah, yeah, like so it's, it's almost like things. putting putting sunscreen on your skin and write yeah, something so and then you like still this. can see it. I like it with the yeah. with the, the pollution. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. And these were two two ideas of um making pollution visible but in two different countries and with the back, with the with the kind of local background. Yeah. I love these um <laughs> these uh, uh, projects. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's let's pick one final project uh, from from your staple. I mean, you've done so many many wonderful yeah. things, and I really recommend to to all the people watching this. Uh, just go to the homepage of of, yeah. of Sandra and just like check it out there. All the stuff is documented there. There is lots of stuff to. Uh, online so just like dig into the stuff even though the the, mm -hmm. the conversation will be over soon but <laughs> yeah yeah then i would say let's pick the last picture yeah i visit 2019 the lee brothers these are two artists from vietnam from hui and the funny thing is they designed two different uniforms like you see from the north and the, the south of vietnam and they mixed them and I took a photo with them in a kind of mangrovey forest where there are no leaves on the trees and it makes it uh, at, at absurdum because of course their uniforms are not working anymore for tan uh, 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 issues. For they, yeah. yeah, it's not, it's not possible. And they invited me to develop works there. And then there was in, now you can show the next picture. Then we were driving to Fung Nake Bang. That's a huge national, national park in Vietnam. And I was really shocked how they uh, destroyed the whole area. And this is one, I think it's it's a very, silent picture on one hand but on the other hand it's so heartbreaking because you see how we deal with this nature and in a lot of uh, i know what is what i want to say is that in 2012 i was asking myself what is important for me and why do i take photographs what what matters in life what is really um, important for us for our existence why am i creative and why am i working in this uh, media and finally when i took this picture i saw that's also one of them because it's so important to show what happened and you cannot describe it in words if you when you see this picture and then the, the this ground is almost red and it's really yeah, in the stark it's contrast to the green hills, that the red, yeah. the red soil and the green hills, yeah. and it, it's it's beautiful, but at the same time, it's 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 horrifying. <laughs> yeah, and at the first moment, I didn't recognize it. I just recognized it as the when the the Vietnamese audience said, "Oh wow, this is one of your best, um, one of your best uh, photographs," and I was like, "Oh okay," <laughs> because. Um, it wasn't, I, I, I didn't, and that happens a lot of time that we are not aware of the, the um, 
issues, but uh, it takes a while till we really can see it or recognize it. Yeah. And sometimes it just takes the right person to see a specific artwork to, yeah. to have the real impact or, or mm -hmm. uh, an art piece arrives in, in the right town at the right time or, or is seen by someone online. So I've, yeah. I've, 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 there, there, there are so many interesting stories of, of that people create something and it sits around and nobody is interested in it for 10 years, 20 years. And suddenly there's the right time and the right context and suddenly an art piece just like unfolds to what it should be just because it was the right time and the right space to put it or something. Yeah. 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 But my, my last question would be uh, because you're also teaching at the yes. HGF. Uh, HFG, HFG, not HGF. No, no, oh, not at, at HFG. That's, um, nope. <laughs> so that's my home. I'm mixing all up all the, all the Hessian <laughs> stuff. At European School of Design. <laughs> okay, ah, yes, okay, okay. I hope there is no there there is no big you know like uh, uh, no everything is fine I guess everything is fine it's okay good okay. good yeah good, yeah good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but my, my question would be because you, you're teaching as well so is there something is there like a, a rule or something that that you think might be helpful for for people out there they may be young they may be old whoever wants to get into uh, creative work wants to get into photography or art something that that some a message or or a, or a, or a tip that you have for people to yeah. to get started or or to yeah. do something uh, it's also written on my homepage that mm -hmm. uh, photographers are seismographs of the society and what is really important they can change also society so what we show the society it really can change. So if you, for example, show more colorful skin or more people, more diverse people, then they get diverse and um, or sustainability. And um, this is what I always um, show my students to um, to always ask themselves what matters because there are so many pictures and so many photos also because of many many mobile phones so always ask yourself does this photograph matters and why and how and um yeah this is what you always have to ask yourself wonderful wonderful <laughs> thank you so much uh, for our little conversation <laughs> It was it was great having you. Uh, Thank we talked you. way over an hour. I see now. It's just like uh, uh, wow. We and we could probably go on for many more hours, but uh, yes. it, it, it 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 was great having you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, please, people out there, follow Sandra Mann on the social media. Go to her homepage. Uh, check out what she's doing, what she has done, what she is going to do. And I hope and I heard there might be some like B3 connection in the future, but I'm not giving away too much, like no spoilers. Uh, but but I, I, th I think it's not the last time that we will have encountered in some way. Yeah, <laughs> would be nice. And thank you. Many thanks for all these nice questions. <laughs> You're very okay. welcome. Thank, thank you so care. much. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Hey folks and dear ladies and gentlemen of whatever gender you prefer, that was another episode of B3 In Depth. If you want to see future episodes, please subscribe somewhere down here. I hope to see you in the future and I hope you join the debate. Thanks. <laughs>